Hello, everybody. Welcome. You're not on video. Welcome to MPG Ranch. I'm going to have everybody mute their microphones to start with. Then you can go off the to unmute later. There we go. Oh my goodness. Welcome, 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 welcome. Oh, we've got a few more people joining us. Fantastic. I'm seeing people from all over the place. I know we've got, let's see, people from Lolo just around the corner, people from Missoula, people from the Kenai Peninsula, people from, let me see, where else do we have? Um, oh my gosh, Rattlesnake Elementary, we've got, we have some people that I don't even recognize where they're from. This is so much, this is great. Um, we're looking right now out the window. Uh, we're down at the MPG Ranch. We are looking at the Bitterroot Valley, which is the, a very popular wintering spot for golden eagles. And I have Rob Dominic from Raptor View Research Institute with me to hear, with me today here. Um, but before we really get started, I want to ask, start by asking a few questions to everybody in the audience. And uh, for this first one, let's go ahead and just use the chat um, to respond and take a couple minutes to go ahead and Oh, that's okay, they don't have a webcam. Go ahead to talk in your class and then respond out into the chat. So the first question that I have for you as we're looking over the beautiful Bitterroot Valley is what do golden eagles eat most of the time? So go ahead, discuss, and then um, start putting some stuff in the chat and then I'm gonna turn it on Rob and he's gonna, he's gonna give you an answer in just a minute. All right, so what do golden eagles typically eat? Ooh, Mr. Martin from Lolo says trout. Uh, Andrea Donovan from Rattlesnake says mice, fish, rodents, and small birds. These are good. Um, let's say Kenai Alternative uh, High School. Do you guys have any any guesses? Ooh, I'm seeing rodents, fish, and birds. So we got the rodents, fish, and birds. This is a common. Yeah. This is very and common. This is golden eagles. This is golden eagles. Yep, these are our guesses for golden eagles. Um, Rob, tell us a little bit about the diet of golden eagles. Uh, the diet of golden eagles is back, very varied, um, but I will say fish is not included. Um, that's why I want to double check because if we're talking about bald eagles, of course, fish is a big part of their diet. But golden eagles, um, it's been observed. Somebody a long time ago saw a golden eagle kind of picking at a dead fish on the side of the road or mm -hmm. side of the river. But for the most part, no. Um, mammals and birds, uh, those are really good guesses. And they don't have to be small birds. They could be birds as big as turkeys or geese or swans. But they are small birds too. Sometimes magpie or even starling <clears throat> have been found in golden eagle nests along with uh, great horned owls even, and great horned owls eat almost everything they can get their grippers on, and they are even <laughs> on the menu of a golden eagle. Golden. And golden eagles can also take animals as large as pronghorn antelope. That's wow. well documented in the literature. Wow, um, I would like to point out that Kenai also said, anything they can find, they are opportunistic hunters. I like that, <laughs> that, that pretty much sums it up. <laughs> Whoever came up with that one. I love it. Okay, this is the next question I have to start you off. Okay, so get ready to talk amongst yourselves. Where do golden eagles like to nest? So talk amongst yourselves and then put it into the chat. 
I like that opportunistic hunter. I like that too. Where do golden eagles like to nest? Hmm. I'm so hungry, I'd eat a dried fish on the side of the creek. <laughs> okay, and we're getting some information. So we have trees and high what was that? High covered places. We have places near water, old snags, high places like trees, light poles, and cliffs. What's your take on it, Rob? If we're talking golden eagles. Trees and cliffs. Um, I like the whoever said light poles is good, but those most of the time that's osprey. Uh, they really are drawn to light poles, so that that was uh, that's interesting to me. But yeah, trees and rocky outcrops and and cliff faces are what golden eagles prefer. And when they do build a nest in a tree, it's generally in the fork, the big fork, and they're amazingly hard to see. Um, when you're nest searching for golden eagle nests and they are in trees, I'm always amazed at how well they blend in. Ooh, I love it. Okay, and the final question for everybody before I turn it a little bit more over to Rob is what habitat do golden eagles prefer? So let's talk a little bit about their habitat. We've talked definitely about two components of their habitat, but let's flesh that out a little bit more. Hmm. Now, one of the things I do know, oh my goodness, it's getting windy outside here in the Bitterroot, and I can tell because I'm looking at a live camera and it's shaking really wildly, and we're going to take a look at that in just a minute. <laughs> now, one thing that's special, like we said earlier, is that the Bitterroot Valley is a pretty special spot. And so um, Mrs. Lee's class said that, that habitat that's important to Golden Eagle is feel, the fields near water, and not too much wind. Um, Ms. Donovan says forests, lakes, prairies, and mountains. Um, we also have Mrs. Johnson says valleys, fields, and near water. So are these are they right, Rob? I, I like all these answers. Um, they like forests, they love open prairie landscapes, they love the mountains, and everything needs water. Um, what we have found golden eagles really select for is very steep habitat as well. So that's, it's kind of one of those things you don't think about right away when you think about habitat. I, I want to think trees or water or fields, but the terrain ruggedness, the, uh, the steepness is very important for golden eagles because I know somebody said not too much wind, but golden eagles love wind. They love high wind. And that's how they're able to ride the updrafts on those very steep, rugged terrains. They can ride the updrafts like a hang glider rides um, along the mountainside, along a, a foothill. And so they do, they are masters of the wind. The golden eagle is more than a bald eagle. Awesome. Okay, so um, we're looking at this table here, Rob, and we've got a whole bunch of stuff laid out in front of you. And I'm guessing that these are all things that you use in your daily life. But there's one thing that I think we should probably start with, and that is the camera. Um, because I do believe you spend quite a bit of time watching this camera. Am I right in saying that? Yeah, well, we do as a collective. I, I'm i not out here catching the eagles all the time, but Adrian and Chloe, they're here all the time, every day, and they're they're watching the cameras. They put in the time, and I got excited a few times today. And, <laughs> and they said, "No, Rob, that's a raven. No, that's a shadow." <laughs> well, so, I want to. I want to see here. I want to do a little observation, and I want to see if you can tell what we're looking at because it isn't super easy to to figure out what we're looking at right now. So go ahead. We're going to make some observations, and go ahead put in the chat what you are observing and especially like i said earlier the wind must be picking up because you can see that the camera is moving back and forth a bunch i hope none of you get seasick watching this um but go ahead and put in the chat things that you observe 
and we'll see how keen your eye is. We have the experts here to, to, to tell us if what you're observing is correct. All right, I see lots of chatting happening. Lots of typings getting ready to come out. Okay, a, a carcass maybe, a boat. All right, <laughs> I know it's not easy, right? So we, we have birds moving around, feeding on a carcass. They're feeding in the valley because, um, because of the wind and they're scavenging. They're eating something, maybe a deer. Let's see, dead animals. Scavenger birds trying to eat something. These are all fantastic guesses. And I think that there are no boats in the picture. I think those, those are gigantic ice chunks moving down the Bitterroot River that you're seeing in the background. But yes, and any, any guesses as to what kind of birds that we're looking at? And I'm gonna show you, I'm actually gonna, oh, that was that one, I think a bird just swooped in and maybe gave you a big clue. There's one bird that's really distinct that I bet most of you are familiar with. Hmm. While we're looking, I'm actually going to switch cameras too, just so we can check the other one and see if anything is happening at this camera site. So, ooh, make that one big. Here is another carcass, which you are exactly right on. Doesn't look like there's much happening here. This one's much quieter. All right, so what kind of birds were we looking at? What kind of birds well, did you see? <laughs> yeah. This is well. We're we're looking at magpies. We have yeah. magpies, and I'm. I really should direct this question to Adrian or Chloe because they're they have a better idea. But I definitely see magpies, which are related. They're in the crow family, the Cor Corbin family, <laughs> and those magpies when they're flitting around out there and feeding on that carcass, that roadkill deer, it's. It's kind of like these little marker flags to let the eagles know, okay, there's something down there. We will come in and check it out. So, and if all the magpies burst and blow out of there really quick, we get excited because we think or we're hoping an eagle or another raptor is coming in. Another, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that's really neat. So we'll be keeping our eye on that. If it happens that we get an eagle, everything will stop and we will go into getting an eagle mode. Um, and you'll get to see that. So we're keeping our fingers crossed that it happens. And if it happens at a little bit later date, we'll email your teacher or time today, we'll email your teacher. So let's just pretend, Rob, that an eagle lands on that carcass. Walk us through what happens. Well, first thing that will happen is Chloe and Adrian will grab the remote control. They're all set up outside. They'll hop in a vehicle and they'll hustle down to the point where we could see the carcass with our binoculars. And then they'll remotely trigger our net launcher, which will shoot a 20 foot by 20 foot net. There's three padded projectiles that fires up and over the carcass, over the eagle. And then they'll run down there, extract the eagle from the net. We will put a hood on it, which takes away their ability to see it just kind of just sits on top of like a hat with a, with visors on their eye covers and that calms them down and we'll, they'll probably put it in the eagle straight jacket and then they'll bring it up here and we'll go to work we'll put some bands on it these are usgs us geologic survey specially serial marked bands that go on every bird that is every bird that Researchers from hummingbirds on up to eagles, they put a band on the bird if the bird is able to have a band. And it has a special number on it that identifies it to that specific bird. Um, if it's a bald eagle, we'll put one of these bands, a color band like this, on the leg. And does anybody have any guesses why we might put this along with this on the, on the bird? Like, why not just a metal band? And, how might this help us? Ooh, any guesses? If anybody has a guess and wants to unmute and just let us know, go for it. Um, should I keep going? 
Sure. What about the other thing that you attach to them? Oh, well, we, we, we take a blood sample. Okay. Is, that's something else that we do. So we have a syringe, blood vials. Um, we have wing tags for golden eagles. So if we catch a golden eagle and we don't, it's not an adult or it's a bird that we otherwise don't want to put a transmitter on, which is coming up next, we'll put wing tags on. And again, these help getting back to the color leg band, these help researchers, I'll, I'll tell you, they help researchers mm -hmm. be able to identify the bird and not just researchers, anybody, citizen scientists, anybody who happens to be driving along, if they see a golden eagle with a wing tag on it like that, or a bald eagle with this color band, they can just Google it up on their phone, say, Google golden eagle with a blue wing tag, and instantly they get directed to us and we get a, a phone call or an email and we can learn where the bird is, has been since we banded it, how far it's traveled, how long it's lived. So that's really, really useful information for us uh, to learn a little bit more about the birds and put some pieces of the puzzle about Golden Eagle natural history and ecology. Well, it's kind of like, I was going to say, before you go on to that, it's kind of like Christmas in a way. You get a, a present and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you had a phone call like a day or two yes. ago. Yeah. It, tell us what happened when you got, like, what did you learn? Uh, I, I got a call. I, I got two calls about the same bird. Mm -hmm. um, no, actually, I had two different birds, now that I'm thinking about it. But I got, a, I got a communication yesterday about an eagle that I banded near Lincoln, Montana, uh, so about 100 miles from where we are, that's where we do our fall eagle work. This is our winter eagle work. And I banded it in 2011, and we had not heard from wow. it or seen it since, and it was picked up on a trail cam. Um, so trail cams are really cool because people, you know, you can you get them reasonably priced, and a lot of people, a lot of landowners like to have trail cams to see the wildlife. And every now and then, or more often than every now and then, one of our eagles shows up on a trail cam. We've had them show up on trail cams in Alaska, in British Columbia, in Montana, in Wyoming, Colorado, Utah. It's like really cool. So, so you're saying this was a bird that you um, banded 10 years ago? 10 years ago. So and you that, hadn't heard from it since? No, and, and we knew wow. it at the time that we banded it that it wasn't even a year old. It was its first fall migration. And some studies would suggest that 70% of young eagles don't survive the first year of life. It's just hard to be an eagle. I mean, if you can avoid being shot or hit by a car or oh electrocuted or, or, or in just starvation, um, if you could survive that first year of life, that's, that's a win. And we know now that this bird is um, like 11 years old. Wow, that's yeah. pretty cool. And, uh, that's really a neat. Yeah, I, and, I, that's, and we've had other intervals, an, an, an interval from the time it was banded to the time it was observed. I think our record interval is like 12 years. Wow. But this was up there. And then some will show up multiple times. We'll get, oh, that bird was spotted in Alaska. It was also spotted in Colorado. And, and you know, so you'll get multiple encounters of one individual. So it's really neat and just helps us learn a lot. That's awesome. Um, I want to pause and see if anybody has any questions. Um, we could do a little bit of a round robin. Um, unmute your microphones and ask away. Um, is there any one class that is just super oh excited? Okay, uh, Mrs. Donovan has one in the chat, so we're going to start with you guys. What is the oldest bird that you have ever ever banded and heard back from? Oh, that's a great question. Um, what is the oldest? Oh. I'm sorry, I gotta think about this. Ooh, this is stump, I started banning birds in, in, in like 2001. Um, we had a researcher, there was another eagle researcher in Wyoming who, I may have to put in a phone call on this. Um, <laughs> phone a friend. Yeah, phone a friend. Uh, I, it was a bird that was tagged by us in 2002, and it was captured at a banding site in Wyoming, and I want to say, so if it was 2002, that, that bird was over 20 years old. It was like 22 years old or something like that. Wow. When, or 20 years old when it was, when it was captured. And, and then what happened is I, 
I di I'm going to digress a little bit here. I was working with another researcher. This is before we started doing our own, and he used to put wing tags on the birds too, but he didn't use a very durable material. So the wing tags were all worn off, but it had a band on it. So this other researcher in Wyoming was able to then take the bird and then put a transmitter on it. And so that is like the oldest. And I think band return records... Well, I know band return records, just the metal band alone on a, on a dead or injured eagle for bald and golden eagles is in the early 30s. But I suspect in my lifetime, we're going to hear from an eagle that is going to surpass that record. I, Whoa. I'm pretty sure. And, and, and finally, with, uh, with, uh, when we talk about our transmitter birds, we have, uh, we've got some birds we've been tracking for. I don't know, six, seven years now, uh, which is really cool. And some people believe this is, I, again, I, I digress a little bit, but eagles in captivity have been known to live to be 60 years old or so. Wow. And some people believe that in the wild they can live that long and breed. And so. Well, that was our next question. What's the average lifespan? So they can live up to 60, but yeah. in the wild, maybe a little bit the little average, less. The average lifespan, that's, that's a tough question. Um, those are numbers are very, very difficult to get at because it's hard to say what the average lifespan is for a golden eagle when we, we get so little data on them from the bands. And um, I think I heard a number of like 12 years. Mm, like the, I, I, like I, the I, average? Um, yeah, but yeah. who knows? Those numbers are hard to get. It's a really good question and very hard number to get at. So, okay, so another question we have is, what other continents do golden eagles live on? That's a great question, because golden eagles are found around the world, found in the northern hemisphere, um, on every, and they're found on pretty much every continent in the northern hemisphere, and there's a, a golden eagle or a booted eagle species that lives in Australia called the wedge-tailed eagle that's very, very similar to a golden eagle. Oh, interesting. So on all northern continents. Oh, that's very cool. And how fast can an eagle fly? A straight flight, just straightaway flight, flapping, powered flight, they have to be able to do about 65, 70 miles per hour. Whoa. And, and they can dive. They can dive at over 200 miles per hour in a bullet dive. Whoa! Yeah. That sounds absolutely crazy. Those are great questions. Thank you, everybody. We'll do some, we'll do some more questions in a minute, and if you have anything in between, just pop it into the chat. Okay, so you were about to show us, Rob, um, that exactly that that's in your hand. What is that? This is a satellite transmitter. So it's a unit, it's a tracking device that communicates with the satellites that we put on the bird's back where we could track these birds wherever they go every day for sometimes years and years. And we can get as many as eight to 10 locations a day with this. It's solar powered. And so as long as that gets some sun, we can continue to get data on these birds and it's amazing what we're able to do we're able to track these birds from alaska <clears throat> down to mexico in some cases that was one of our records um but everywhere all the habitat that they're using where they're hunting where they're roosting um just everything about these birds that a few decades ago you never would have been able to answer now we can track them from our computer watch the birds daily and we do this with dozens of raptors, including dozens of eagles, and it's just really amazing. Cool. So I want to go ahead and share my screen again and have the students do some observations. Um, we're going to take a look at the data that you collect when you track those eagles. Here we go. Hold on, everybody. All right. We should be seeing a map of the United States, specifically the Western United States. And I'm hoping that you see uh, Paul and or Polly and Clarice. And I think there's another one in there. So what we're looking at right now um, are the ranges of where where these eagles are. And so every time um, one of these eagles 
um, who has a tracker on, mm -hmm. every time that tracker hits the satellite, it sends a, a point back to Rob. So I'm actually going to come up here and I'm going to select all of these golden eagles. And this is a resource that you have access to um, on some of that information in the pages that we gave you. So you can see these are all the eagles, the golden eagles that Rob has put a tracker on. Um, and that they're currently tracking. And what's what's fun is you can watch how they move. So we have some that hang out in Montana um, all year round. We have some that go up to Alaska. Um, I don't know if I have any that are exactly on the Kenai, uh, but there are some that are definitely pretty close. And I'm sure you 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 know about birds that head up to yes. the Kenai. Yes. Yeah, so then you can see them coming back down. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select none of them, and then I'm going to look at Clarice. So Clarice, and we got to move this little timeline over a bit, like so. So we can see that Clarice, and Clarice is a brand new bird. In fact, she was tagged, or she was had a transmitter put on her about... A month ago, would you say? Maybe two? Um, let's see. Uh, Adrian and you told me they would know. Yeah, when did you guys, when did you find it's Clarice? About, it's this season, yeah, and maybe a month and a half ago? month ago? Yeah, that sounds about a month ago, maybe. Yep, okay. Cool. So this is really new data. Um, and I think one of the neat things is you don't even know if this is a migratory eagle or if this is one of the local eagles that hangs around no, all year, right? Don't. And somebody had a question earlier, what percentage of our birds are migratory and which percent are, are locals or residents? And I I couldn't, I, I think I said like 30% are local yep. and 60 migratory, but I don't know, maybe somebody else here might be able to. <laughs> That's another idea? Yeah. So what I wanna to do to begin with is I'm going to zoom in a little bit. Let's get our, let's get some bearings so we know where we're at first of all. And then I'm going to ask you to make some observations and type those observations into the chat. So, all right. Um, for those of you that are in Montana, you may recognize this lake. It is one of the biggest lakes in Montana, um, if not the biggest. Um, it's, it's the largest freshwater lake west of the, mis west of the Great Lakes. Well, there you go. It's a huge lake. And yeah, it so is just north of Missoula. So some of you may be guessing Flathead Lake, you are exactly right. So we've got Flathead Lake here. So if we come down from Flathead, oh, look, you can see where these valleys kind of meet together. Um, I, I bet some of you know where this place is. So this is Missoula right here. Um, this is, goes down the Bitterroot. Oh, here's Mr. Martin's class down in Lolo. Hey, Mr. Martin's class. Um, we are right about here on the MPG Ranch. And so Clarice is hanging out over here in the Swan Mountain. So just a little bit east and north of Missoula, Montana and the MPG Ranch and Florence, Montana. So I'm gonna start zooming in a little bit and I want you to make some observations and these observations can be about um, where Clarice is going. It can be about the landscape. Um, you, you choose. So let's just take a look right here and make a couple of observations and then we're going to zoom in again. So go ahead and um, type those into the chat and then Rob will tell us a little bit about what he, what he notices as a researcher. Okay. Yeah, just tell me to chime in whenever. I, I will. All right. So, what oh, are you guys seeing? Oh, while cool. while you're while you're thinking about those observations, you want to answer this question? Yeah. How do we know if it's a boy or a girl? That's a great question. With with golden eagles and almost all birds of prey, the females are larger and more powerful than the males. With golden eagles, there's overlap. You could have real big boys and smaller girls. But we take a bunch of measurements, and one of the measurements we use is how big their foot is. And that's, that's one of our telltale measurements for de determining if it's a, a boy or a girl. So this is a big girl. Okay, yeah, and uh, Mr. Martin's class says that she is landing 
randomly and I, I wonder if we if we zoom in if you will still think it's a random landing landing random landing mrs donovan said asked the question of what changes um affect her flight patterns so i think we'll also get to see some of that too so i'm going to go ahead and zoom a little bit in oh they noticed the one long straight line but that she's mostly in the mountains so why don't you talk to that one large, the, the, long straight line the one long straight line we meant to tell you guys that's that's an errant point that's that's a glitch in this in the system so um, we'll, we're going to get that cleared off. But yeah, so that it, it's not like it flew to Oregon and back in <laughs> one hour because we do get fixes about every hour is when we get a fix. So each one of those dots usually represents an hour or at least a location where she stayed. Oh, good questions. Which direction did she come from and where is she going? You know, what we can do is we can actually play this and you'll see a little bit about it's going to go fast. So watch, watch quickly. But she's going to come on the scene here. Oh, so she came all over the place. She'll come back. Oh, and I, you know what I might do is just zoom out a little bit so you get a bigger picture. We'll put this back over here. So here she comes. It's like she came maybe from the west. Whoa. <laughs> she's, she's, yeah, that's a little hard to follow. Basically, what she did is she left shortly after banding she left our area and now is heading heading up in this uh, swan valley blackfoot valley area and we have found a number of our eagles have gone up there in uh late winter mm -hmm. and uh and early spring and there's a, a few reasons for that one is there's um there's uh, these roads this narrow valley and it, in this valley are a lot of deer and we know for a fact that are more killed deer along this stretch of highway than probably anywhere else in in um in western montana and the eagles are selecting to feed on those road killed deer and sometimes when we look at these points and this one in particular there are some some of these locations that are very close to the road in this narrow mm -hmm. winding canyon sections of this valley so that makes it very dangerous for golden eagles and there are Every winter, golden and bald eagles are, are killed on this highway. So we've been watching Clarice really closely because she's clearly feeding on roadkill in some of these areas. And um, with the snow starting to melt a little bit, the road department generally picks up the roadkill. But if there's a lot of snow and the roadkill gets buried under the, the snow burns, and then when the snow starts to melt, it exposes the roadkill again. So it's a dangerous area for golden eagles. We're, we're, we're a little worried about Clarice. Yeah, and so you can see this line right here. That is the road. Um, other things that you might observe, you can see that the, there's some prairie land. So that might be good hunting for those that, rodents. Well, that, that is, and that's the Blackfoot. Some of that is the Blackfoot Clearwater Game Range it has big elk herds. Oh, um, and there could be some lion kills out there, it, and uh, or maybe even wolf kills. And so the 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 golden eagles scavenge a lot yep. in the winter. You can also see that there's a lot of mount, uh, mountain tops and ridge lines. So that good steep terrain that you talked about earlier, Rob. This mm -hmm. looks like a really nice habitat. Um, and the water. So this was something that I'm not sure if you said during this this show or this pro, this event or another one but it's not that they're eating the fish near the water but they're oftentimes eating the water fowl is that yeah is that correct so some of those lakes um might be um home to yeah um, ducks and ducks geese. and geese and golden eagles they're, and golden eagles are they they can they can tackle a lot of different prey but some become more specialized at, let's say hunting waterfowl where others might be more specialized or just get better at hunting mm -hmm. uh, jackrabbits and so some of these uh northern these alaskan eagles the ones that nest up in the north slope of alaska and just all the all the waterfowl and shorebirds that could be up in that region maybe clarice is a northern bird and maybe she's selecting hanging around those bodies of water because she's picking off some waterfowl so I don't know. We don't yeah. know yet, but next month we'll tell because yeah. March is the biggest month for adult golden eagles to um, for their spring migration. So we'll know pretty soon here if Clarice is going to be a resident of Western Montana or if she's going to come from points north. 
Yep, and you can see we have Polly here, who is a migrating bird, and this ans um, maybe answers Amaya's question. Some of them migrate and some of them hang out year round. Yep. Um, and so there's a mix. So you can see that Polly goes up and spends a bunch of time up in Alaska, um, where we don't know about Clarice and Aurora. It looks like she kind of hangs out in this area. Aurora is an interesting bird because we wing tagged Aurora before she was an adult. Oh. And, and we had had some 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 uh, wing tag encounters of her, and then we caught her a couple of years back, and the crew caught her. And really, what was neat about her? She's a big beast of a golden eagle. I mean, they're all they're all powerful and impressive, but Aurora is a particularly uh, beastly female, adult female golden eagle. And when we caught her, she the first time we caught her, she reeked of skunk. And the second oh, time no. we caught her, her wing tags were all stained from skunk spray. Oh. So we cut the wing tags off her. It just takes one second, pop them off, and we put a transmitter on her. And now we realize she's nesting just off the boundaries of the MPG. All right, I'm going to have you head back on over. So those are some really good questions and some really neat things. But so you've had the transmitter. You've looked at the you've looked at the data. You've started to get an understanding of the territory, whether they migrate, if they don't. But there's something else that you do when you have them, and I'm wondering if Chloe, I'm going to put Chloe on the spot here, who is another researcher, might tell us what what else you do when you have when you have a bird, um, and then what you're working on right now. Yeah, so like Rob was saying, we take vials of blood, about three milliliters, and once we have the blood, we'll suck it up in one of these capillary tubes and put it on this little testing strip. And we'll put it into this lead care little robot here, and it'll tell us how much lead is in the eagle's blood. And that's what I've been doing all morning. <laughs> We're a little backed up, just got the robot in, and um, we just finished our last bird. It had a count of 30.4. Oh, so high. Yep, and those numbers, when, when Chloe says 30.4, that. To put those numbers into perspective, if if you or I or any of us humans, if we have a level of let's say ten, we'd probably go to the hospital. If you're a little kid and you have a level of five, that's bad because it could it's been shown to uh, impair uh, mental faculties, physical abilities, digestion. So 30 is getting up there. So we look at these, zero to 10 is generally a background. Uh, 20 to 40 is like a subclinical range. And we get a lot of eagles in that 20 to 40 range in the Bitterroot. Uh, matter of fact, 95% of the eagles we, we, have, we have captured, of over 100 have elevated lead. Um, and then if we go from 40 to 60, that's getting into a subclinical or a clinical range. Um, and then if we go from 60 to 100, that's that's the clinical. That's that's getting way up there. And we had um, when they were running the test day, we had one bird that tested 58. So mm -hmm. that's getting up there. And anything above 100 is really that could just outright kill them. Yikes! So, yeah. And so these eagles, not just here, but across the country, are really, uh, they're coming into contact with lead almost everywhere they go. And they're getting that lead far and away from, from gut piles um, that they scavenge in the forest uh, from hunter-killed deer and elk. Another source is, um, depending where you're from, a lot of people out west in Montana and other places like to shoot prairie dogs and ground squirrels and and they will get lead from those carcasses too. Some hundreds of rounds, even thousands of rounds of ammunition could be dumped in a field. I saw a video of a of a, a trailer being pulled across a dirt road and it had scaffolding planks set up and there was two tiers of shooters lined up on this and they were just shooting all the ground squirrels and the eagles were just coming in and grabbing the ground squirrels. So and that's because they're using lead bullets. So we take a look at that, the, what the, what actually happens yeah. and why lead bullets do that? My cue. This is your cue, yeah. <laughs> so what are we looking at here? So 
Okay. All right, Kathleen has this, Anna White, Kathleen this, Dent. this resin display. And so what we have here are our two bullets before being fired. This is just a bullet, not the, not the powder, usually the part that you see. This is a copper bullet, solid copper. And that's what it looks like after it's removed from the animal. This is a copper jacketed lead core bullet. And that's what that looks like when, it, when you remove all the particles. And it's this powdery stuff right here, minute, microscopic sometimes, but just teeny tiny little parts. Those can penetrate into the muscle tissue of the animal up to two feet and, and they're throughout the gut and the wound channel. And so when, a, when the animal is dressed out, um, when you gut it in the, in the woods and you leave the guts behind for scavengers to eat, this is what they get into. And even some of these small particles, you wouldn't you wouldn't know that if that was in a bowl of venison chili and you were eating it, you would never know that those particles were in there. And that's what happens with the eagles. And that's why there we have 95 percent of the eagles with elevated lead. It's a big problem. But the good news is it's something that can be corrected for because all we have to do is switch to non lead bullet and we could save a lot of eagles. Oh, OK, great. Well. Let's go ahead and go back to some questions. Um, there is one that's a very important question. How do you pick their names? Um, that's a good question. Uh, the crew picks the names, and we'll have to ask Adrian or Claude. How do you guys pick the names? Oh, man. Uh, usually, I feel like it's just... It comes to we, you naturally. We have the bird, we have and the bird like in the hand. Seams. Like a good name. Yeah. Like, this is a Clarice. Yeah, yeah. Clarice. Yeah. And just the other day, we had a really small, young, not young, but really small male golden eagle. And we called him Tim after the artist, Tiny Tim. Or well, the Charles Dickens character. Exactly. Or the Charles Dickens <laughs> character, Tiny Tim as well. So that's how he got his name. Yeah, Tim. He's not up on the raptor tracker yet, though. He's a recent one, so. Oh, that's a couple great. days though. It'll be up, hopefully. Yeah, we usually wait a few days to make sure everything's all right and everything's working with the transmitter before they get up on Raptor, Raptor Tracker. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, and I wonder, I wonder too, maybe you guys could put in some suggestions or email mm -hmm. me some a list of suggested names for future well, future eagles. Thinking, the kids great. Classrooms yeah. could come up with names. I'm I'm amazed at the names these guys come up with. <laughs> yeah, I like that. That would be really fun. We could have a name. A, a name the eagle contest, which would be pretty cool. Sometimes we get a bird that we're not sure if it's a boy or a girl, and we got to send it in for DNA. So we try to come up with a name like Pat or something. Yep, <laughs> that works out well yep. too. Like a gender neutral name. <laughs> um, oh, here's a really interesting question. What do you do when there's a fire? And I mean, that's or when what when there's a forest fire. So and that's huge. Like well, that's a big forest fires big thing. are an issue and. If an eagle is nesting in a forest that's burned, the nest is going to get is going to get toasted, and the eggs and the young won't make it. The adults can just fly away. And there's been some evidence to suggest that on the edge of a forest fire, when you have animals fleeing, raptors can take advantage of that. And so you have animals that are normally being more secretive and and undercover that are more or less running for their lives. And the raptors will take advantage of that and swoop in and grab them up as they're fleeing from the fire. Yeah. Wow. That's a good question. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty. That's a a pretty big um, issue nowadays, especially in Western Montana. I'm not so sure as much up in the Kenai if they're having um, another another problem is drought and and extreme heat. Um, that was a big issue last year in the West with, with raptors and uh, young raptors were just bailing out of the nest because they were just so hot and just. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. So we have another question um, from Ms. Johnson's class. When you put the wing tag on, does it pierce through the wing? Is it harmful? That's a good question. What we use is a button, like a, a wing ear tag, like a cattle ear tag button. I'm going to zoom in on that for them. Yeah, there, you there go. we go. Look at that. And we, we smooth out the point so it's not real sharp. And the skin on the leading edge of the wing is super thin. It's, it's like rice paper almost. And so what we do is we set it up so that we don't hit any. We, we know exactly where we're putting it. We're piercing this thin membrane, almost like a bat's wing. 
this membrane of skin and it goes we set it up we, we push it through and it's it's less than getting an ear pierced it, it we never get any blood we just put them on and the eagles get right back to the business of being eagles once we wing tag them and we set them up just right and we've seen our eagles with wing tags out fighting other eagles uh, we, we wing tagged one that we caught this method of carcass trapping we wing tagged it it was about um, about five miles north and then we were trapping at another station using uh leather vested pigeons and bow nets it's a whole other system of catching it's like, literally it's like you're fishing for raptors where we have these big like hula hoops with springs and we were up in a little hut in the mountain and we're jigging them in with with leather vested pigeons and anyway we let the bird was let go about five miles north and it got on the ridge and it was riding that wind right towards us and we couldn't tell it had wing tags on at the moment and we showed it the pigeon and it came down and uh, we caught it again so they don't dwell on these things too much and they give us some great information for example the most recent one was a, an eagle that we we know we tagged in 2011 and we recited it looked great that's really awesome. Well, you guys, we're about out of time today. Um, fantastic. Oh, okay. A last question, and then yeah. fantastic questions today. Do the wing tags ever get in the way of their of them or their that's flight a, or anything? That's else? a good question. And, and the wing tags. When I first started using them, I was like, "Wow, this is this is." I don't like putting these on these birds. But what I've learned over the years, and they've been used auxiliary marking. Raptors with wing tags has been used on a lot of different species. Um, California condor is one of the most famous birds that have wing tags. But no, I, I truly don't believe they affect the birds. We have no evidence to really uh, suggest that they do. We have never had a mortality that we could link to a wing tag. And most far and away our wing tag encounters are birds that are alive and well, and if they are dead, they're not dead because of the wing tag. They're dead because somebody shot them or they got hit by a car. Um, and they're, they're, they're sort of a top predator. There's not yeah, many things that are going to take not, down. There's really nothing that's going to kill a golden eagle less another eagle or maybe a mountain lion or a wolf if they're on a, if they're wow. scavenging on their kills. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you, everybody. Questions. Wonderful questions. And thank you guys so much for participating today. And Thank you to Adrian and Chloe and Rob for sharing all this awesome information about the research that they're doing um, with Golden Eagles. We'll have to get you a win. We're, we're making a new wing tag encounter map, and it's Ooh. pretty amazing. It just shows wing tag encounters from Mexico to Alaska and, no way. and all up and down the Rocky Mountain front, which, by the way, the Rocky Mountain front is the number one place on earth to observe golden eagle migrants. Like oh, eagle that is so cool. Well, thank you, everybody. We will see thank you me. next time. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thanks, everybody.